My name is Barbara Smith. I'm the president of the St. Louis chapter of the Federalist Society. And on behalf of the St. Louis chapter, the other Missouri chapters, and the Federalist Society national organization, I wanted to welcome you this evening to our candidate forum for candidate for Missouri Attorney General. Um, before we get started, and I pass the mic to our moderator, Mark Bremer, I wanted to take a moment and just explain what it is the Federalist Society does, for those of you that may not know, and to remind those of you who are repeat customers to our events. Uh, we exist uh, to promote three core principles. One, the state exists to preserve three freedom. Two, the separation of powers in the Constitution is fundamental to, to, to that freedom and to our constitutional order. And three, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. We do not take positions on public policy issues and we do not endorse candidates. Instead, we're an organization of lawyers that exists to promote debate, reasoned and thoughtful discussion, and respectful disagreement. Uh, and that's exactly what we hope to do today in this candidate forum. I expect there will be some reasoned and thoughtful disagreement amongst our candidates. Um, but, but, but central to that mission is the idea that we can debate important issues that impact us as Missourians, as Americans, with civility. And our two candidates have agreed today that civility is important to what they're going to talk about. They're going to talk about their views of the issues. Those views will be different. Um, but they'll, they'll do it in a thoughtful and respectful way that focuses on the issues and not on ad hominem attacks. So thank you for that, um, for that understanding. We also want to uh, extend the same um, presumption to members of our audience and hope that you will be respectful of the candidates even when they say something that you, uh, that you disagree with. Um, I'd also like to note that we invited all candidates for Missouri Attorney General to attend today's candidate forum on the same footing at the same time, well in advance of today's event. Um, and we're very thankful that these two candidates have agreed to accept that invitation and are here this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, who is a prominent local attorney, Mark Bremer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, and for the kind words. I am honored to serve as moderator for these two gentlemen. Um, I have gotten to know them a bit getting ready for this, and I uh, admire and deeply respect both of them. And I think you're going to enjoy hearing uh, what they have to say, and they're a font of articulateness and knowledge. Uh, let's give an early round of applause for Will Sharp and Alad Grove. And Alad Grove. Oh, me too. Okay. I would like to echo uh, what Barbara said about civility. It is very important for what we do in this era of hyperpartisanship. We like to have debates that are truly characterized by civility. We think this is the best way to move forward, maybe find some common ground, and uh, be a model for uh, otherwise deeply felt contentiousness mm -hmm. throughout our society. Um, Will, you got any words of your own on that topic? On the subject of civility specifically? Yes. I just think it's great that there are forums like this that exist where we can yeah. come together and talk about the very real policy issues that are facing our state. Uh, and hopefully for all of you to come together to learn a little bit more about our race. Oh. A lot, a lot, and I have done a few of these events now. And I like to think that we've been, uh, been respectful and civil to each other uh, throughout this process. And I'm, I'm deeply appreciative, obviously, to the Federalist Society for pulling this together for a lot for being here and for all of you for, for turning up on a night when I'm sure you had uh, other things that you could be doing as well. So thanks a lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And Mark, and thank you so much for doing this too. Um, look, I mean, we're going to be talking about some important issues. We're going to probably have a few disagreements, but here's the big benefit of you all being out here and having the two of us. If there's something you disagree with, in a few seconds after, you're probably going to hear something you do agree with. So they'll be fine. But yeah, just so everybody have a good time. I think this is really important. These kind of discussions are really important. Uh, and having folks who are responsive to the people of Missouri should be what our government is all about. So thank you all for participating and being a big part of that civic process here in Missouri. Thank you all for coming to do that. These two are a terrific model of civility. 
Uh, if you haven't seen it, they had a debate with the third candidate as well mm -hmm. in Springfield, Missouri, about a month ago, and it was remarkable. There were, it was a beautiful event, uh, and uh, both from the panelists and from the audience, it was a model for civility. That's what we'd like to try to duplicate uh, here tonight. And uh, we all, uh, while we have no doubt whatsoever that there will be any problems in this regard, uh, any attendee who does disrupt the conversation here tonight will be escorted off the premises. And uh, that is not going to occur, however, but I'm, I'm obliged to give that statement at the beginning. Having said all of this now, I'm going to now explain to you the previously agreed format for this forum. Each candidate will begin with five minutes for self-introduction, explain himself. I will not deign to introduce them and give their background or foreground. They're going to have to do it out of their own mouths, and they're going to do a very good job of it. Then that will be followed by five minutes per candidate for their so-called opening statement where they will tell you what they plan to do as Attorney General of Missouri. As moderator thereafter, I will be asking some predetermined questions of the candidates. They will each get the same question. They will each get 90 seconds to answer. And if uh, one of them specifically mentions the other in a substantive way, I may uh, give 30 seconds additional for, uh, uh, for rebuttal by that, that candidate. And then after we go through the, the questions, and I think we'll have about a dozen of them or so or more, as you will see, then they will each have three minutes for closing remarks. Uh, will will speak first for the introduction and opening statements. Uh, Elad will uh, then go next for the, he will go first for the closing remarks. And then I will alternate between the two of them uh, in asking the questions. So we think this is a fair and equal uh, way to do it. And then at the conclusion of the forum, I think we'll have some time left. We'll see, it could be a half hour, maybe 45, uh, where you may stay here and mingle with the candidates, with each other, maybe mingle across the aisle and find some common ground. Uh, and we need to be out of here by 8 o'clock, but you're free to mingle <laughs> get before out. then. <laughs> Make now, sure to get out. No liquor yeah. will be served, so we're not going <laughs> to hold you around. Um, so uh, that is the plan, uh, and that is the format for this event. Uh, so now let's begin. I asked them each to take the podium for their five-minute uh, uh, presentations. And uh, Will, uh, you have five minutes to introduce yourself, please. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, my name is Will Scharf. I'm a Republican candidate for Attorney General. I'd like to start off just by thanking the Federalist Society for pulling us together. Uh, the Federalist Society's mission is one that's uh, been very important to me for a long time. I was president of my student chapter in law school. I think it's fidelity to its core principles. Uh, as Barbara said, that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of powers is central to our Constitution, uh, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what the law should be uh, is admirable, uh, is something that I think uh, most Americans would agree with. Uh, and I think, as, as Mark alluded to, I think it's more important uh, now, probably uh, as much as ever before in American history, uh, that there are real opportunities for people to come together and have civil debate uh, over the very real issues that our state and our country faces in the coming years. Uh, so I've never run for office before. My background is not, not as a politician. Uh, I'm a constitutional attorney. Uh, currently, most notably, I'm representing President Trump. Uh, we've litigated for him in cases, uh, cases in courtrooms across America. Uh, including all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we've won some, some pretty big wins for him. Uh, before that, uh, before I started running for office, I was a federal prosecutor. I was an assistant U.S. attorney here in the Eastern District of Missouri, appointed under President Trump. Uh, I was in the violent crime unit. I led over 100 federal felony cases uh, targeting, uh, we did gang interdiction work in North St. Louis. I prosecuted fentanyl dealers, armed robbers, carjackers, bank robbers. People are usually surprised to learn that folks still rob banks. Uh, but it was really rewarding, impactful work, and I'm proud to have done it. 
Uh, I've also worked as a conservative activist. Uh, during the Trump administration, I had the honor of working on uh, judicial confirmations and nominations. I was on the teams that confirmed Brett Kavanaugh to the U.S. Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Uh, and what we saw with both of those fights, I think, was really instructive. Uh, and that is that when conservatives really dig in, when they don't shy away from tough political fights, uh, when they're willing to double down and recommit to our core principles, that we can get really remarkable things done. And I think the transformation in the Supreme Court uh, over the last half decade has been one of the greatest successes of the conservative movement in a long time. Uh, so my objective is bringing that sort of outsider perspective uh, to government in Jefferson City. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the issues uh, that we both believe, that all of us, I think, believe uh, face this state in the coming years. Uh, but really, more than anything else, I think it's time for a break with the past. I think the existing Jefferson City dynamic needs to be broken uh, if this state is going to get ahead. And that's really what motivated me to run. Ilad, you're next. Okay. Yeah, well, there's not a third one here, so that's pretty easy. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Alad Gross. I am running for Attorney General of Missouri to sue a whole bunch of scammers, including those in our government right now. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I grew up uh, here in St. Louis. Uh, I uh, grew up in U City. I know a lot of folks were asking, where did you go to high school? Uh, went to Clayton High School, actually just down the street right here, Clayton Greyhound. Uh, it is our 20th anniversary this year of winning a state championship in football. And as you can tell, I was one of the really good players on the team. Uh, no, my shoes played in the state championship game because a guy forgot his that day. So uh, I got something in there. Uh, look, so since, uh, since high school, I've done a few things. Uh, I went to uh, Wash U for law school. Uh, I was working with kids in the city of St. Louis on a program to provide free summer opportunities for children uh, in unfortunately highly impoverished areas. Uh, that's how I became involved in public service in the first place. I've met so many of you in this room uh, from the work that I've done with kids, and uh, that's really important, crucial work. And it's what drove me into law school in the first place. Because you could just see all the things that are happening in a classroom that we can't control because of the outside factors there, whether a kid isn't eating that day, whether a kid isn't getting all of the books that they need in the classroom. And so that's what led me to actually meet my first state representative over in the uh, Hyde Park neighborhood in St. Louis, uh, and eventually went on to uh, law school uh, and then joined the attorney general's office. I was an assistant attorney general of the state of Missouri when Chris Coster was the attorney general here. Uh, worked in multiple divisions, primarily the labor division, uh, where I received 1,300 cases on my first day as a public servant for the state of Missouri. You're welcome, everyone. Uh, and then from there, uh, went on to the litigation division where I did trials, appeals, both federal and state court. Today, I'm a civil rights attorney. I sue the government. I protect our civil liberties and courts all over our state, including in the federal system. I've sued folks all over, unfortunately, oftentimes for violating our basic rights, including our rights to see what our government is doing through the Sunshine Law. I have one of the landmark cases. It's Gross v. Parson. I'm the gross guy on that one. Uh, won a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court to protect your ability to see what your government is doing with your money. So I feel very strongly that we need a watchdog in our government. I've been very drawn to this office because of all the wonderful things that we can do here. Uh, today I live in the city of St. Louis with my wife, Tasha, who's in the back. Uh, got two siblings here, uh, one of whom I'll give a shout out just in case you're watching right now. Uh, my sister uh, is in the hospital. Uh, she has a, a weird infection. She's getting better. Uh, but if you're watching right now, hi, and hope you're getting even better right now because you're super embarrassed that I'm even bringing this up. Uh, but look, there are so many parts of our lives that the Attorney General's office touches on, from health care to affordability to making sure that our civil liberties are protected. And that is my plan for the state of Missouri. It's about time that we we have someone who has our back in that office, and that's why I'm running for attorney general. So thank you all. Will, your opening statement, what will you do as AG? You know, I think Missouri faces real problems in the years ahead, as it's faced for many decades now. Uh, and I think the, the biggest problem that we face is a deeply broken and corrupted political culture in Jefferson City. 
Uh, Missouri is a deep red state. We voted for President Trump by 19 points in 2016. And yet the policy dynamic in this state doesn't look like other deep red states. We're not Texas. We're not Florida. Uh, we're even getting lapped by Tennessee and Arkansas now. Uh, our streets are overrun with crime. Uh, our schools are abjectly failing our young people. Less than one in four Missouri eighth graders are proficient in math and reading. And yet when you look at the State Board of Education, when you look at the education establishment in Jefferson City, their principal priorities seem to be things like pushing down new DEI and social emotional learning mandates that I think do nothing to actually educate our young people. I think when you look at Jefferson City today, you see a political culture that's deeply in hock to a very narrow set of special interests and lobbyists and political insiders. And that's why our state budget has doubled by, uh, it's gone from 27 billion to 53 billion in the last five years, uh, with no noticeable improvement in the lives of everyday Missourians, at least that I can discern. Uh, we've been all over the state, we've driven over 45,000 miles now, and I have yet to meet a single Missourian who has stood up and said, I think the folks in Jefferson City are doing a really great job. So what do I think we need from our attorney general's office? I think we need an attorney general's office uh, that is deeply committed to rooting out the corruption and the insider deals in Jefferson City. I think we need an attorney general's office that is focused first and primarily on defending the rights of every Missourian in courts, both here in the state and around the country, and not on lining the pockets of, again, this very narrow set of special interests and political insiders who are running this state even though their name has never appeared on a ballot before. So we started this campaign over a year and a half ago. We've been to every corner of the state. We haven't taken a single dollar from any Missouri lobbyist. And we think we're going to win because the people of Missouri are pissed off. The people of Missouri understand that what's going on in this state cannot continue if this state is going to have a brighter future uh, than its, its recent past. I think that we can solve all the problems that ail this state but it's going to require political outsiders who are willing to shake up the dynamic in Jefferson City. And until we start doing bold conservative things, we are going to keep getting more of the same. And I believe that more of the same is completely unacceptable. We need an attorney general's office that actually wins in court. We need an attorney general's office that isn't hemorrhaging personnel. They've had 50% attorney turnover in the last year and a half. We need an attorney general's office that's fo focused on the issues that actually matter to Missourians and not on the issues that matter to whatever particular special interest happens to be in a politician's ear on a given day. So that's what we're running to achieve. We're looking to bring power back to we the people here in the state and take power away from the folks who have been robbing the state blind for far too long. Elad, your plan. See, I told you we're gonna agree on a lot of stuff today. Look, uh, when I worked there, it's a great point. When I worked there, we had 200 attorneys working for you in that office. And I already told you how many cases I had when I started there. I can't imagine right now where some numbers are saying it's less than half of that now. And you wonder, you know, we, we are traveling a lot, and I'm traveling around the state quite a bit. And the number of folks who have called our attorney general's office because they've been scammed, someone stole their money, something happened in their community. And they get nobody because there's no one there to even answer the phone. We need a major change in that office. We need someone who knows how to be the attorney general of Missouri. We need someone who's going to make sure that when you have a problem in your community, that person has your back. That's what the attorney general should be doing. So I've got a whole lot of plans, and I'll tell you about some of them right now before I run out of time. As attorney general, I will get that consumer protection division working for Missourians again. We are going to sue a whole bunch of scammers. We're taking them to court. These folks who are calling us on our phones incessantly, asking for your social security number, asking for your bank account information, trying to get you to go down the street to buy a bunch of gift cards so you can get out of a warrant for your arrest for something. These people need to be sued. And they know that nobody's enforcing the law here in Missouri. So of course they're coming here. We're going to end that in Missouri. We're going after these folks, and we're going to make them pay. And that's part of what that office should be doing already. Absolutely. As attorney general, 
I will get the conservation division brought back to that office. It was an, op- yes, it was. It was a division that existed there when Jay Nixon started it. Unfortunately, Josh Hawley got rid of it when he was attorney general. But that is the division that is designed to protect our land, our air, and especially our water. And if you want to talk about, yes, if you want to talk about what the federal government has done to Missourians here, just look at what happened with the Manhattan Project. Look at what has happened in North County and Weldon Springs with folks who there's cancer clusters now in Missouri because they left radioactive waste here and they knew they were doing it since 1949. 1949. Our attorney general can sue Joe Biden for everything under the sun, but he can't figure out how to sue him to protect Missouri families when we need him the most. And we're going to change that too. It's ridiculous. As attorney general, I will start this state's first concerted, coordinated effort to deal with violent crime and prevent it in our neighborhoods. I have had so many kids who have been impacted by violence all over our state. So many. And when you talk about prosecutions, those are so important because folks who do the wrong have to be held accountable, especially when you're taking somebody else's life. But we have to talk about preventing that from happening in the first place. Because by the time we're prosecuting someone, someone has died, a family has been broken. We need to reinvest in our communities. And we need an attorney general who's going to coordinate law enforcement and community members to make sure that folks are diverted from making those bad decisions in the first place. We can get that done. Other places have. We can do that right here in Missouri, too. And the attorney general's office should be involved in that. As Attorney General, I will start our state's first civil rights division in the history of our state. It's about time. And this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. Oklahoma has one of these. We don't have one, probably because he'd have to sue himself at this point. We need to have real civil rights protections in our state. And I will make sure that we get that done. Look, there is, there is so much. I agree with you. I clap for that. I'm a civil rights attorney, you know? But look, there is so much that that office can do for us. So many things. And so for so long, you look at our government, they want us to accept mediocrity. They've defunded so many of our systems. They're pitting us against each other so they can privatize and some billionaire can make even more money off of our backs. We're going to end that. And we need an attorney general who's going to get that done and always have our backs. And that's what I will do for you. And now for the question and answer. Um, The first question is on a topic that each of you addressed somewhat in your opening statements. And uh, Will, it will go to you first. And here it is. What would you do as Attorney General to address violent crime? And in your answer address, how you would work with local prosecutors that have a lot of the responsibility to prosecute crimes? In this regard, what type of criminal activity do you think should be the highest priority for the Attorney General as Chief Law Enforcement Officer to investigate and prosecute? Yeah, look, the the science on crime prevention has been well settled since Operation Ceasefire in Boston and the Giuliani miracle in New York in the 1990s. The way you solve violent crime is by incapacitating violent criminals. Uh, Crime follows a very tight Pareto distribution. It's a very small number of violent criminals who perform a vastly disproportionate amount of the violent crime in any given community. Uh, So what's the answer? The answer is you need to lock those people up. Uh, When you talk about crime, you're really talking about three buckets of issues. You're talking about policing, you're talking about prosecution, and you're talking about the courts. Right now in Missouri, we're failing on all three fronts. We have underfunded, undermanned police departments. Right now in the city of St. Louis, I promise you, if you go to District 4, District 6, there is a single patrol car on the road this shift. That's just completely unacceptable. On the prosecution front, you have far too many cases being lost, far too many cases that are never even being brought, uh, certainly the way that they should be. Uh, Plea deals are out of control and rampant uh, in a way that's really affecting the the felt effects on the street. And lastly, we're a deep red state with deep blue courts. Uh, Our bail laws are far too weak. We need much tougher rules on pretrial detention. And then with respect to sentencing, we need actual truth in sentencing laws so that when people commit violent crimes, 
uh, they are prosecuted. And after they're prosecuted, they are sent to prison for the terms that they deserve uh, and not just released back on the streets where they can continue to reoffend. That's what we need to do in the attorney general's office. I think ending Eric Schmidt's Safer Streets program was a terrible idea. We need to be prosecuting much more violent crime, not less violent crime. Uh, thank you. <laughs> same question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I talked about it a little bit. It's an issue that is uh, very important here. I mean, I've had a kid who was shot and killed in his backyard the day before he was supposed to start first grade. And we can prosecute that guy, but that's not going to bring him back. I feel very strongly that not only do we need to have prosecutions, to have all of these expectations set so that folks aren't going to make those decisions, it's we have to really get involved in preventing this in the first place. And Boston is a great, exa Boston is a great example because they have all of these intervention plans where they are doing real community work to prevent violence from occurring in the first place. And we have to make sure that housing stability is such an important issue. Education is such an important issue. Job opportunities are such important issues. And those, if we start to reinvest in the communities that this state, unfortunately, has broken for so long, we are going to get better results and people are going to make better decisions because they'll believe in themselves, they'll believe in the opportunity, and we do need leadership that believes in that. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a long plan. Obviously, there's a lot of work that we have to do here in Missouri, but there's a public safety division at the Attorney General's office that is designed to provide legal support in this area, and I will make sure that it does, and that no community in this state will be left behind. Uh, next question, it will go to Elad, you first. What, if anything, should the Attorney General do to ensure that public universities adhere to the requirements of the First Amendment, while providing for the safety of students and others on campus, what steps will you take to ensure free speech on campuses at state colleges? Yeah, uh, well, it's a great question. I'm a big believer in free speech. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I would start Missouri's first civil rights division in the history of our state to protect our First Amendment rights. And look, if you're in school, you have a right to get that education. You have a right to be safe too. And I think that we can balance that. In Missouri, we've actually done a really good job. I know some of the folks who uh, uh, are attorneys for our state system that I used to work with at the Attorney General's office. And I, you know, I think that we can certainly get that right. The Attorney General's office can be a part of that when needed, but I think we've done a pretty good job here in Missouri already having this kind of civil debate in our society. So uh, I think it is important to have the Attorney General step in when necessary, but really we need to talk about all of these civil liberties that we have to be protecting from that office. There's so many things that are just slipping through the cracks right now because we don't have any enforcement from a civil liberty side generally, even beyond campuses. And that's why it's so desperately important that we have a civil rights division at the Attorney General's office. Look, peaceful protest absolutely needs to be protected. But what we're dealing with on college campuses across the country today, and certainly here in the state of Missouri, uh, is radical leftists with a pro-terrorist agenda making campuses completely uninhabitable for Jewish, Jewish students and any other student who may disagree with them. I think that's shameful. I think it needs to be stopped. And I think it just shows how wildly off base uh, American political culture has gotten, where you have people who think that their highest and best calling in life is shilling for a terrorist group that's killed Americans and killed innocent people abroad. I also think it's worth noting with respect to the actual attorney general's office and its core functions that the folks funding this protest movement are the same people who funded Antifa. It's the same people who funded the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement. You're talking about the Soros Network. You're talking about Arabella Advisors and you're talking about the Tides Foundation. And when you have these left wing dark money nonprofits that are raising money and spending money in the state of Missouri, the Missouri Attorney General's office has ample authority to investigate and to hold them accountable for the illegal activities that they are supporting. And I think that's something that absolutely needs to happen if we're going to prevent our colleges and universities from descending into utter chaos. This next question, I'm going to break down into three different parts. The general question is, how would you approach the enforcement of the state's abortion laws? 
And then I'm going to give three specific hypothetical, law students hypothetical situations, <laughs> and I will split them up into, it, that's the general question, and then I'll give you the three uh, specific hypothetical situations. And on this one, we will start with Will. So again, how would you approach the enforcement of the state's abortion laws? The current attorney general joined a lawsuit to challenge the safety of an abortion pill, Mifepristone, that has been on the market for decades. The Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero that there was no standing for such a lawsuit. If elected AG, would you continue such suit? So am I answering the general question or the specific question or both? Both. Okay, so I'm pro-life. I've always been pro-life. I've been involved in pro-life advocacy for a very, very long time. We need an attorney general's office that's going to support uh, pro-life policies, that's going to bring pro-life litigation. I think one of the biggest problems we have in that, office is in that office right now is that they keep losing in court to Planned Parenthood. I mean, some of the more liberal members of our audience should be applauding our current attorney general's office <laughs> because of their failures in court. The state of Missouri is paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees to Planned Parenthood. That needs to stop. We need conservative fighters. We need conservative winners in that office. With respect to the Mifeprex lawsuit, I mean, this is a drug that the Obama FDA, when they approved it in 2016, said this drug will put one in, one in 10 women who take Mifeprex end up needing surgical intervention on the back end. That's a dangerous drug. I think the overall litigation uh, is sorely needed. And I think the FDA approval process needs to be looked at. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that the efforts to intervene in that lawsuit by Missouri and other states uh, weren't successful because that would have neatly resolved the standing issue in that case. But under my leadership, the attorney general's office is always going to stand up for life. We're always going to stand up for the safety of women. And we're always going to make sure that Missouri is well represented in courtrooms across America. Elon, go ahead. I think we need to stop wasting our money on these stupid lawsuits. That's my view of that. Miffy, Miffy is, is safer than Tylenol. We've known that for a long time. So unless you're going to ban that thing, I mean, we're not banning this either. Look, today is the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision, which took away so many rights from so many, especially in this state, because it took them, what, like 10 minutes for them to sign away all of the rights that women are having and reproductive freedom here in Missouri. And look, in November... You're going to have an opportunity to vote for a brand new attorney general, and you should definitely do that. But while you're there, there's going to be a ballot initiative that, by the way, our current attorney general tried to make sure that we didn't even have our constitutional right to put it on the ballot in the first place. But you're going to have an opportunity to vote to put reproductive freedom in our state constitution, which means that we are going to stop this extreme abortion ban that even Donald Trump disagrees with, by the way, here in Missouri, one that requires 12-year-old rape victims to carry their pregnancies to term. That's how extreme it is here in Missouri. That's how extreme it is. And I've talked to plenty of Republicans who are pro-life too. And it's just, this is nuts. It is absolutely nuts. And so on, in November, you're going to have an opportunity not only to protect abortion rights here in Missouri and end this extreme abortion ban, protect our rights to IVF, protect our rights to birth control, because our legislature is out of control. And it's about time then we end it too. So as Attorney General, we pass that and put it in the state constitution. I will protect your right to reproductive freedom in the state of Missouri. The second hypothetical regarding Missouri's Ooh, I got uh, fired up on laws. that first one. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Another, Elod, Elod, this goes to you first. Great. Congress is currently considering a law to protect IVF access nationwide. Do you believe Missouri should adopt a similar IVF protection law? And if the federal law passed and it conflicted, though, with Missouri law, what would you do as AG? We should pass a law to protect IVF in Missouri because we cannot trust the people who are leading the state of Missouri. That's a big problem. It's a sad statement. I mean, I don't even want to clap for that either. But it's, 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 it's where we are right now, 
you know, folks are saying, look, if you're ever in this situation, you definitely call a lawyer because we will fight to make sure that you have that right. But there's questions right now about the language to the point where we've got Republicans and Democrats in our state legislature talking about passing a law to protect IVF. That's how extreme we've gotten in Missouri. That's how extreme it is. So yeah, if the feds, they should pass. I mean, the feds should do something. Congress doesn't do anything right now. They should do something to protect our reproductive rights across the country. And if there's a conflict with Missouri law, I mean, we've got the supremacy clause. So I know that some folks think that uh, federal gun laws don't apply here in Missouri. Another losing case by our attorney general, by the way. Uh, it's that if there is a law, it needs to be enforced here in Missouri. That would have to go federal enforcement if there is a federal law. But we need a Missouri law to protect that as well. And we need an attorney general who is going to protect our rights in that office. We need that so desperately. We need to pass this, and we need to have an attorney general who is going to enforce the law as we voted on it. I think it's sheer alarmism. There's nothing about Missouri law that imperils IVF in any way. I'm pro-IVF. As I said, I'm also pro-life. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we, may, we maintain our state status as a life respective state. Uh, and I don't think there's really anything going on either federally or here in the state that would threaten, uh, threaten IVF as a procedure. Uh, I think the much more real risk uh, to Missourians, to maternal health, is some of Planned Parenthood's practices. The reason that a lot of uh, Planned Parenthood clinics have been closed historically don't groan, uh, it's true. When the Columbia Clinic was investigated by the state, uh, they found black mold in a suction apparatus, and they found conditions in that clinic uh, that wouldn't have been allowed in any ambulatory surgical care center in the country. So I think we have a real problem with maternal health in this state, and I put the blame for that at Planned Parenthood, not on, I think, phantom efforts to ban IVF by our legislature, which I just don't think are real. The third hypothetical. Okay. On the well, question you're getting really good at these, you know? yeah. Yes, yes. The text, and Will, this goes to you first. The Texas AG recently faced a lot of bad publicity for suing a woman seeking emergency medical care after she received a terminal diagnosis for her unborn baby. As AG, would you sue women or doctors for seeking? are providing medical care to women who are suffering miscarriages? Well, first of all, I'd fight the hypothetical. Uh, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton is a friend. He's endorsed us in this race. Uh, what was at issue in that Texas litigation was health care providers in the state of Texas who were flouting Texas law, who were violating Texas law. I think the law needs to be applied as written. That's a core tenet of the Federalist Society. And I think the law needs to be enforced. And what was going on in Texas was not an effort to persecute a woman. It was about holding health care providers who viewed themselves as above the law to the law. As Missouri Attorney General, I will enforce Missouri law, period, end of story. No. I mean, look, and, and this is a really good example of why this election is so important, because you can look at that law, and I've done a whole lot of research and talking and presenting on all this stuff, and it is a confusing law. It is not clear. The fo I know the folks who wrote it. I know them, and they're a little confused about it all, too. And there's a lot of gray area in there, and it's extremely important that when we look at the, prosecu the prosecutors that we're choosing to and the attorney general that we're choosing, that we have somebody who is going to have our backs and is going to make sure that we're not putting women in prison. I mean, we're talking about, you talk about big government, small government. I'm a small government guy. I don't think that we should be using state force. State force. For somebody who doesn't want to have a pregnancy. I mean, what, what are we doing? We talk about having all of these interventions in so many areas of our lives and everything else. I believe that the government's role is to stay out of our families' lives to the greatest extent possible. Let us make our own decisions. It is fair to attack my hypotheticals. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I, I, will I was like, he's I going will, over the line. I will continue doing so. <laughs> yeah. oh. All right, good. Now, another Okay, tool, this is uh, another part general question, but a couple specifics within it. Uh, Elada, we'll go to you first. Please explain your view of the Attorney General's role to ensure election integrity 
and in doing so answer two questions. Who won the 2020 election? <laughs> and in 2020, Georgia state officials came under immense pressure from President Trump to, quote, find votes, close quote, to flip the state in Trump's favor. If you received a similar call from President Trump as a G, what would you do? Hmm. Uh, I'd ask for some recipes, maybe. Uh, talk to him about, you know, things that we can do to actually benefit people in Missouri. And if he kept asking, I'd have to hang up because I don't want to listen to that all day. Uh, if you're talking about, uh, well, we're talking about who won the 2020 election. That's easy. It's Joe Biden. Joe Biden won the election. There's not really a question about it. I mean, heck, Mike Parson says he won the election. I'm not questioning that. He's the governor of the state of Missouri. Joe Biden won too. When we're talking about election integrity, and you can look at all of these, you know, I mean, there's, there's a foundation. The Heritage Foundation puts up a whole database about all the bad things that happen in the other state. They're not happening here. Not happening here in Missouri. A lot of these stories are just made up so that we get scared about what's happening. I believe very strongly that our elections should be secure. I think we do a pretty darn good job of that right here in Missouri. And I know some of you have worked with local election authorities on that. We gotta make sure that continues. And I believe very strongly too in transparency in our government. And I think, look, you wanna put some cameras up, let people see what's going on, great. More transparency, the better, because you should have confidence in your elections. And the moment that you have people who are attacking that, sometimes they're doing it for a reason because they want you to start questioning everything around you. They want us to be divided against each other so much so that we don't look at the folks who are in leadership right now and start asking, what the heck are you doing for me? That's what they want out of all of this. You want to talk about election integrity? The attorney general violated that when he decided that he didn't agree with this ballot initiative and he was going to go to court and illegally stop us from collecting signatures for months and months. He was told by multiple courts that you're violating the law. Follow the Constitution. So if you want an election integrity issue, it's about time we have a civil rights division here in the state of Missouri too. So I'll fight the hypothetical. What President Trump did consistently in, in conversations with congressional leaders and state leaders was to ask them to investigate election fraud because the 2020 election was probably the most highly irregular election in American history. I mean, the most highly irregular election in American history. Uh, when you look at the fact that there were over 100 earlier absentee votes, just never out of 158 million cast, never happened before in American history. When you look at the issue of private financing, you can keep interrupting me, I'll just keep talking. When you look at the issue of private financing of the election apparatuses in key states, that, that's the Zuckerbucks issue. And frankly, when you look at the absolute social and mainstream media blackout on any negative stories uh, about Joe Biden, most notably the Hunter, the Hunter Biden laptop story, I think, you, that, I, think that, I think that adds, which has now, by the way, been the Hunter Biden laptop's been introduced in evidence in federal court in Delaware by Biden's own DOJ. That adds up to the most rigged, unfair election in American history. What can we be doing for election integrity here in Missouri? Alad's right. We're actually a lot better off than most other states because we don't have universal mail-in voting, which is the greatest avenue for election fraud in the country. We need to do things like voter roll maintenance. We need to make sure that illegal immigrants aren't voting in the state. I think there's a lot that our state can be doing, uh, working with, with DHS, working with federal authorities to ensure that our voter rolls are cleaned up and that we don't have people who shouldn't be voting voting here. And I think that, as Alad said, election integrity is extraordinarily important. People need to have confidence in their elections, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that Missourians know that our election system is as safe as it can possibly be. Look, at the end of that question, we ended up agreeing. Did you see that? I mean, not the whole way there, but, you know, well, still still stuff. So just, you know, we're all, we're all I'm, here. I'm yeah. good with transparency. Yeah. I think we need more transparency I, in our I, elections. I'm with you, 100%. Common ground. See? Look, we did it. We did it. We did it. Uh, next question. This one is for you first, Will. As Attorney General, what steps would you take to protect religious liberties? In this regard, what is your view of the separation of church and state, and in particular with regard to such issues as school vouchers? Yeah, well, look, separation of church and state is not in our Constitution. Uh, what our Constitution guarantees is free exercise of religion, and it protects us against the establishment of religion. 
Uh, nowhere in the Constitution is this idea that's been embraced by the left that there has to be an absolute wall uh, between religion and government. I don't think that's there. I don't think those are the values that we should be promoting as a state. With respect to school vouchers, the idea that public money can't flow to religious schools on an equal basis uh, with non-religious schools, with non-denominational schools, that comes from James G. Blaine, who is one of the most vicious anti-religious bigots in American history. I am deeply grateful that the Supreme Court has finally rejected Blaine amendments, has finally rejected the idea uh, that public funds can't flow to religious organizations on an equal basis uh, to the way that they flow with, with secu with, to secular organizations. Uh, I think we need more choice uh, in our schools. I think we need more choice in education. I believe in an education system that's focused on the needs of parents and students and not school districts and administrators. And I think anything we can do to push our state closer uh, to that as an ideal uh, will ultimately redound to the benefit of Missouri students who are currently being terribly failed by our educational system. So I absolutely believe that religious liberty needs to be protected as vigorously as possible. I think religious liberty is the first freedom guaranteed to us by our constitution. Alad and I, this is another point of commonality, are both members of a religious minority. And I'm deeply grateful for the fact that America has always protected the religious rights uh, of its citizens. And I think we need to make sure that we have a state government that's going to do that. Yeah, um, I mean, it kind of went into education a little bit too. We talked about vouchers. Vouchers well, are multi part. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. Yeah. He's getting us. Uh, Criticize the hypo. Yep. <laughs> it's good. I won't attack this one. Vouchers are a sham. Vouchers are a sham. And you can take a look because if you look in the Missouri Budget Project, which is a watchdog over our budget process, and everybody, whether you're on one side or the other, should take a look at it, uh, those vouchers are going to very wealthy families because they don't cover the full cost of most of these schools. And so when you have that, right, who is benefiting the most? And you see this in all these other states, and some of them are like, I didn't know this was going to cost so much money. So I think, look, if we're looking at our education system, Missouri, after the Civil War, had cutting-edge public schools led by, with funding, massive funding, by progressive Republicans in our state. There were people who came to Missouri to see what we were doing in our education system. And look at where we are now. We have taken money out of our public schools. Sometimes they even pretend like we're having a lottery. We're going to put somebody in there, and then they lie to us about that. They take money out of our public schools, and then they say, look how bad your public schools are. We should do something about that. Let's privatize it so that some rich person can make even more money off of us. We should get back to doing what Missouri did best, and that is having wonderful public schools, wonderful, cutting-edge, world-class public schools. And we talk about freedom of, of religion. These folks came to this country to escape persecution because it was, that's why the Establishment Clause even exists. And we need to enforce that too from the Attorney General's office. I do believe there should be a separation of church and state, and we need an Attorney General who believes that as well. I'm going to ask three more questions on topics related to education. I think they're very important. Uh, but they're very uh, distinct questions. The first one goes to you, Elad. Yeah. What is your stance on federal Title IX requirements regarding mm -hmm. transgender individuals in women's bathrooms and locker rooms and transgender individuals in women's sports <laughs> and the Missouri Attorney General's role with respect to those issues? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, so right now there are some proposed changes to Title IX. Uh, it has not included sports quite yet, but some folks are worried there's going to be some kind of discussion about that. Uh, in Missouri, here in our state education system, does anybody know how many transgender students were trying to play sports? Ten. There were ten. There needs to be local control over our schools, and I think that we are making really good local decisions when we let people do that. That's what we need. And I, you know, this big government trying to tell all of our families how to raise your kids, what to do here, everything we know better than you. I, I don't care what issue it is. I am not in favor of that. Again, I support a small government. I don't want all of these interventions in families. I don't want them telling us how to live our lives. And there are a lot of kids. There are wonderful kids all over. The, if you, you should talk to some people and see what the needs actually are. And, you know, if we just treat some people with common decency and understanding and compassion, instead of trying to come to places where these folks, 
These folks with all this power want us to be hating each other over an issue that really isn't impacting a whole lot of folks. And why is that? We all should be asking that question because they are getting away with murder. They are getting away, they are stealing the promise of our state at so many, and they don't want us to be paying attention. They want us at each other's throats. And we need someone in our government who's going to bring us together on issues that we agree about and is going to move our state forward in that way. And that's what we need. That's what we need. So th this time I'm actually going to answer the question because it's very important. What the Biden administration is trying to do with Title IX is the same thing that the Biden administration is doing in numerous other areas of administrative law. Absolutely. What they cannot achieve through the political processes set out by our Constitution, through the way that our country has always been governed, they are attempting to achieve through administrative diktats and by administrative fiat. And that's wrong. That's unconstitutional. That's not the way the country is supposed to work. And it has to stop. If you believe everything a lot believes, go out and pass a law. Until then, don't twist and distort federal statutes in a way that they were never designed to operate just to achieve your radical policy agenda. That's what we need to stop. When you talk about small government, federal overreach, the intrusion of the federal government into issues that have always been preserved to the state and are rightly left to the states by our constitutional system of government is one of the greatest threats to our liberty that we face as Americans today, and it's got to stop. There was a lot of passion in both answers, and I sense some common ground there. That, I actually agree. Yep. I agree with that. Very yeah, good. I, I, I yes. agree with that sentiment. I, I, I hope this isn't taken a disparage. I mean, I, I've previously called a lot like he's got this weird libertarian communist thing going, and I'm yeah. always, I'm always interested in where he comes down We're on trying issues. to square the peg on that one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We got some time. We got some time. Are, are these two guys good? Yeah. Uh, next question regarding educational institutions, Will, goes to you first. In 2023, the U.S. Supreme Court ended race-based programs for college admissions. Can this decision be used to end DEI programs in Missouri public schools, both K-12 K and higher education? And uh, what about any such programs that might exist in state agencies as well? Yeah, I think the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution means what it says. I think it sets up race neutrality as the law with respect to the government in this country. And I think that's what we need to be fighting to preserve. Uh, I worked on SFFA v. v Harvard in its early stages. Uh, that's the case that insisted on race neutrality in college admissions. I think it's a very important case that vindicates a right that's been recognized in case law uh, for decades, going back to Adirond constructors and that whole previous line of Supreme Court case law. Uh, I think with respect to Missouri state government, if you look at actually how we spend our taxpayer dollars, there are numerous set-asides for individual racial groups, for individual ethnic groups. I think that's wrong. I think Missourians should be treated as Missourians. Uh, I believe in a colorblind government. I don't think we're ever going to get past our country, excuse me, our country's complicated history uh, with racism until, as Chief Justice Roberts said in his, his parents' involved dissent, uh, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, I think that's how we have to be setting up our government. And I think it's shameful that in a state as deep red as Missouri, uh, we still have these sorts of issues playing out in classrooms and playing out in government grant programs all across the state. I, th I think with respect to that specific case and what the impact will be, uh, it will have to be litigated. I don't think it answered that. And in fact, in some of I mean, for example, the military academies were exempted from that decision. And that was a footnote in there. So I uh, highly recommend that folks take a look at that. But, you know, we're talking about the reason that some of these programs exist in the first place. And for anybody who is here um, and has felt left behind, like folks looked at your community and said, you don't matter as much as someone else, that your voice doesn't matter. This country has a promise. And part of that is that every one of us should have equal opportunity. 
and our country cannot work unless that basic promise is fulfilled. And whatever you want to call a program, whatever you know thing you want to think about, I think that no matter what we do, and whatever government service that we have, and whatever program that we put together as the people of the state of Missouri, that we should always have in our mind, how do we make sure that every Missourian has the ability to access this opportunity too? And I think that that's where we should put our focus. Whatever that means, whatever that looks like, we need leaders in our government who believe that every Missourian matters and that every Missourian should have equal opportunity to the next one. That's my belief. One more question on the topic of educational institutions. For you first, Elad. Sure. What is your stance regarding parental rights in Missouri's K-12 public schools under existing and proposed laws and regulations, I guess including at yeah. local school board levels? And then what is the attorney's role with respect, with respect to such parental rights? Yeah, no, great question. Um, Parental rights belong to parents. That's how it should be. Uh, and, you know, I've worked with schools for a long time, the city school district here for about 15 years. And, uh, man, for a long time, you just go to school board meetings, you hear about all of the issues, and there's three people there. Uh, I have had folks call right from all across the spectrum, political, whatever else it is, asking questions about their schools. How can I see what's happening in my schools? And I'll tell you what, you talk to... Most teachers in Missouri, they want you to be part of that process. They want you to be involved in your kids' education. They want you to be, I mean, you're such a crucial part of that. So, you know, I think that a lot of what's happening in Missouri, at least in my experience, is that folks are not really familiar with how our government works. Most people don't even know who our attorney general is. If you don't know the name of your attorney, that's a big red flag, by the way. But I think we need to do a much better job as a state government, as state leaders, to let folks know how our government works, how you can be involved in that. And one of the most important things the attorney general can do, one, is a civil rights division, if I haven't mentioned that a few times already, to protect our educational rights. But two, to enforce Missouri's sunshine law so that you have access to everything our government is doing. You're paying for it. You should be able to see it. And that's what the Attorney General can do on that issue, in my view. Yep. Our State Department of Education, DESI, currently has a budget of over $10 billion. It has over 1,800 employees. Neither of those numbers have ever been higher before. And yet our schools are comprehensively failing to educate our students. I think we need an education system that focuses on parental rights, that focuses on student achievement, and that doesn't focus on the woke garbage that we're seeing come out of government in Jefferson City. Until that fundamental dynamic changes, we're just going to end up back in the same situation over and over and over again. So what will I do as Attorney General? First of all, I think we need to investigate DESI. I think we need to understand how this completely unaccountable bureaucracy is so comprehensively failing our students and our families all over the state and why it's done so for so long. I think we have a real problem. A lot's right on this. We have a real problem with government accountability in Jefferson City. Folks whose names have never appeared on a ballot, deep state bureaucrats, you can call them, a lot of my supporters would, uh, run this state in a way that has left our, our core governmental functions like education. Uh, essentially, how, how should I phrase this? Parents today don't control the education of their, of their children, uh, and that's wrong. Until we break the Jefferson City dynamic, we're going to keep getting more of the same. Uh, and that's just not good enough, especially when it comes to the education of our children. We need an education system that puts parents and children f first and foremost, and bureaucrats and school administrators last in line. I promised three questions on education. I noticed the next one oh, is wow. also a rose in a wow. school district context, but it involves other issues as well. Okay. This goes to you first, Will. Mm -hmm. Louisiana recently adopted a law requiring all public schools to display the Ten Commandments in classrooms. Is that law constitutional in your view? And if Missouri passed a similar law, what would you do as AG? Yeah, well, I'll address the legal issue first. Under the Bladensburg Cross case, uh, you can even go back to McCreary and Van Orden. 
Uh, I think there's a very strong constitutional argument that the uh, the Ten Commandments being put up in a classroom is constitutional. I think with the demise of the Lemon Test, uh, that's the world that we're living in today, which I think leaves that issue up to the legislature of this state. And I think it would be great if our legislature did what Louisiana did. As I said before, I don't believe that the Constitution requires a strict separation between church and state. I don't think that's what free exercise or the Establishment Clause means. I think we need to think more deeply about what this issue is really about, though. This issue is about what core principles do we hold dear as Americans and as Missourians. And I think the Ten Commandments state uh, core principles that underlie our legal system. Uh, they underlie much of our, our history, our, our legal history, our in some respects, our political history. I see nothing wrong with school districts or a state legislature uh, seeking to emphasize the Ten Commandments uh, as an admirable statement of principles. Uh, so in that respect, I think Louisiana's got it right and Missouri should follow along. From a legal perspective, again, uh, we're not living in a lemon test era anymore. And I think, therefore, uh, there really is no legal problem with putting up, uh, putting up a Ten Commandments monument. Was that too nerdy? I don't know how many lawyers are in the room. I'm not sure if I should be talking about case laws much. <laughs> there yeah. are some lawyers here. It works. It's unconstitutional. And it's a waste of the taxpayers in Louisiana's money. It's going to be a waste of our money if it comes here. And if you want to spend that money somewhere, just because you want to put it somewhere, put it into civic education. Put it into our classrooms. Put it on issues that actually matter. If you're itching to sue somebody because you just feel like it, sue those scammers that keep getting on our phones all the time. Go and protect our rights. Go enforce Missouri's antitrust law against all of these huge concentrated mega companies that are ripping off Missourians across the, all across the state. We need we need to be spending Missourians' money in the right way. And when I was, when I was an assistant attorney general of Missouri, I remember, because we had this whole form. It was like, oh, where are you spending the money? What are you going to do with it? Legal expense fund, everything else. And I remember saying, on my way to licking Missouri, I said, oh, well, I can just take a nap in the car. Won't have to spend any money on a hotel. And my secretary said this, don't worry, we booked the cheapest one for you in town. We've got to get back to that kind of mentality. Stop wasting Missouri's money on stupid things. Start doing real work that actually benefits Missouri families. And that's what we have to do at the Attorney General's office. This one is to you first, Elad. If elected, would you as Attorney General continue to, to represent the three state senators sued for allegedly defaming a private citizen who was attending the Chief's Parade? In this regard, uh, as we, uh, many of us may know, the governor has come out against the representation and has ordered the Missouri Office of Administration not to pay out any settlements or judgments with taxpayer dollars. <laughs> What's the answer, friends? No. no. I mean, come on. Talk about wasting taxpayer money. I mean, these guys got on their private Twitter accounts to defame this poor guy. This poor guy whose only crime was being at the Kansas City Chiefs Parade and drinking a little bit. And there happened to be a shooting. And now this guy, all he wanted was an apology from these three people, and they wouldn't give it to him. Why the heck do we have to pay for that? We shouldn't. There's no reason that we should. You want to do that kind of stuff on your time? Go get your own lawyer. Don't come to my office and ask for one. You ain't going to get one. You're not going to get one. Yeah, first of all, the lawsuit itself is garbage. Uh, the statements in question weren't defamatory. They don't meet the standard for defamation under the law. That having been said, I don't think the AG's office has any role here. Uh, and I think that the AG's office should not have intervened. The legal arguments that they've made for why they needed to intervene about protecting Missouri jurisdiction or something like that are absolute bunk. But it's really important to understand why this is going on. What we have seen from this attorney general's office from the start is a highly focused press operation and an absolutely abjectly failing legal operation. Yep. Every yes. time there is an issue in the news, Every time there's an issue in the news, every time there's an opportunity for free press, the AG's office comes running in. 
That's not a way to run a legal office. We need to be winning in court, not winning TV appearances. And that's a fundamental problem that we need to address with the AG's office currently. Yeah. Uh, this next one, and maybe the last one, is for you, Will, following up on what we were just talking about. I read over the weekend that Attorney General Bailey has announced that he will be filing a lawsuit against the state of New York for interference with 2024 presidential election. What are your views with regard to such a lawsuit? Look, well, I've been representing President Trump for a year now. I was in that courtroom in New York. I have never seen a more unconstitutional, uh, completely invalid criminal trial in my long career in the law. You're talking about Sixth Amendment violations, due process violations, enough evidentiary issues to literally fill law books. That New York trial is a disgrace, and that's why we're going to get it overturned on appeal. With respect, <laughs> with respect to what A.G. Bailey is doing, I haven't, seen, I haven't seen his lawsuit yet. He ran out to the press. He made a whole bunch of statements. He did his TV tour. They haven't filed their complaint yet. So I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm looking forward to seeing what legal arguments they're going to make, because I think it's very important now more than ever that good Republicans all over this country stand together and defend President Trump. I think it's absolutely essential that we fight back against this Biden administration orchestrated campaign of lawfare that threatens to fundamentally undermine our system of elections. That is, it, it's, we've never seen this before in American history. Our elections are supposed to be contested at the ballot box, not in the courtrooms. And I think ensuring that that fundamental principle holds is absolutely essential if we're going to have a country in a couple of years. I, on the other hand, am not looking forward to reading it because when I do, when I see the number of pages and the paragraphs and the poor lawyer's name at the end of it, I think about how much money we just flushed down the toilet every single time. And you know what? You want to talk about transparency of the attorney. You ask our attorney general right now, how much money have you been spending on these crap lawsuits? You know what the answer is going to be? I don't know. I don't track that number. I don't track that number. That has got to change at that office. Well, I mean, we have seen what somebody can do over there who does not have the best intentions and just wants to spend all of his time using our money to get on TV. We ought to know just about how much money he's spending on all of that. And I will make sure that happens at the attorney general's office. We need serious accountability. And we would need serious accountability throughout our government. One division that we are lacking here in Missouri that I will make sure we get started there is a public corruption unit to make sure that our tax dollars goes exactly where it's supposed to. You should not live in a community where your roads are broken, but there's plenty of money for it. You should not live in a community where you've got these state senators and everybody else who just want to throw your money out by making the attorney general pay for it. We need to have serious enforcement against corruption in the state of Missouri, and we will get that done when we win this election. We will get that done. That concludes the questions I'm going to ask. So uh, now we're job. ready for... Thank you. Thank you both. Great job. Uh, well, yes, yes, please. Come on. Come on, Dale. Thank you. I had a little help from my friends, but thank you. <laughs> um, so closing statements. Yes. And Elad, you go first. If you'd like to take the podium for that, you may do so. What do you feel? You feel three minutes? Down? Okay. You want to go up? You want to feel like you want to go up? He's energized. He's ready to go. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll... Let's go win this election. There are so many reasons why our attorney general needs to be fired in November. So many of them. And you heard a whole bunch right here. This guy has taken what was once a wonderful office. And he has done incredible damage to it. We should never be in a situation where we wonder whether our attorney general is going to do work for us. That should never have happened. And here we are. But we have an opportunity to change that. Folks all over the state, you know, we talk about it being a red state. I think it's red because people are pissed off. 
I think we're frustrated with the fact that our government isn't working for us, with all these bills that are being proposed in the legislature, and you read them, and they're super complicated, and you're wondering, what in the world is that one going to do? And then the answer in the back of your mind is, I bet some really rich person paid for that. And it's probably going to make a whole lot of money off of that, too. Our attorney general should be our attorney, not the attorney for big government, not the attorney for the governor, not the attorney for big corporations that are funding his campaign, but your attorney, you and your family's attorney. We need someone to stand up for working families in the state of Missouri, and that needs to be the attorney general of the state of Missouri. That needs to be. It needs to be. There are so many issues that that office deals with. And we know what Missouri can be. We know our neighbors. Sometimes maybe we disagree with folks. But we know that together we can accomplish so much in the state because we've done it before. So why not do it again? We should be at the top of the list, not at the bottom. We know we can be so much better, no matter what your political background is. And this office shouldn't even be a political one. We should be hiring the best attorney for the job who is going to be our watchdog and make sure that we are represented in our own government. In our own government. It's supposed to be ours. So if you agree with some of the things, or maybe everything that I said, I hope it's everything. But if you agree with the things that I've said today, if you agree that we need an attorney general who's going to represent us, that we need a government where our voices are being heard, that we need to start suing scammers and getting that office working for Missourians again, protecting our families, making sure that we're safe in our neighborhoods, making sure that we're safe on the job, then I need you on our team. And if you're watching out there or you've got a cell phone right here because I know you're getting scam calls just like me, you can join it right now. Go to the website, alodgross.org. Heck, he's going to yell at me if I don't say this too. You can even text my name, Elad, E-L-A-D, to 55444. 55444. And that's how you can get involved on this campaign that is going to make sure to hold these people accountable and make sure that our government belongs to the people of Missouri once again. Thank you all for the time. Will, you can go a little bit over the time as well. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I got it. No problem. The funny thing is, is that Alad and I agree on the means, we just disagree on the end. Alad and I agree that Jefferson City is viciously corrupt, has been thoroughly corrupted by special interests and lobbyists and political insiders, and that the political class in this state has fundamentally failed the people of Missouri. When you look at this city, we're here in St. Louis, this city used to have more Fortune 500 headquarters than any city in the world not named New York. Our streets used to be pristine. Our schools used to be among the best in the country. What happened? The simple answer is that Jefferson City, under Democrat rule and Republican rule, has lost sight of the bigger picture. They're so concerned with squabbling over the scraps of your tax dollars and basically handing over uh, huge portions of, of the government uh, to whatever special interest comes calling, whatever lobbyist pays them the most money, that we, the people of Missouri, are left holding the bag time and time and time again. The only way we are going to change this dynamic, the only way that we are going to build a better Missouri for the future, is if we throw the bums out who are running that state and we bring new political outsiders into office who can lead this state in a fundamentally conservative direction that will actually drag us out from the doldrums that we're in today. If you want better schools, let's tear down the education establishment in Jefferson City. Let's investigate Desi. You want less corruption in government? Let's investigate the people doing the corruption. You want safer streets? Let's start prosecuting some violent criminals instead of this catch and release garbage that is getting people killed on the streets of St. Louis, on the streets of Kansas City, and increasingly on the streets of rural communities every single day. As I said at the outset, I've never run for office before. My background is as a constitutional attorney, a violent crime prosecutor, and a conservative activist. 
Running for office has been one of the most humbling, daunting things I've done in my entire life, but I am more energized today than I was a year and a half ago when we started this whole process because the people of Missouri deserve better than we've been getting. And if we don't shake up Jefferson City now, we're going to lose another generation of this state's history. My name's Will Scharf. I'd be honored to have your support. A rousing round of applause for both of these guys.